We've been doing these factory and workshop tours for over a year now. After hundreds of hours of footage shot, I've come to realize you can never assume what you'll see through the next door. Now this is the home of X-Ray, just outside of Frankfurt, Germany. And if it weren't for the big service trucks parked outside, you wouldn't expect this is the home of one of the most successful cross-country rally teams in the world. As a racing enthusiast and a passionate photographer, I don't think you can beat this. Le Mans and Monaco have their charm and their allure thanks to the brilliant markers behind the scene. But this, Cross Country Rally, this is the perfect mix of man and machine conquering the most beautiful terrain you didn't know existed. As great as it looks, it's a mere small percentage of what these trucks actually see over the course of a two week rally. And ultimately, I want to see what it looks like from inside the cockpit. But first, let's see how these trucks get built. This is the home of x ray the 2013 Dakar winners. Now here's where you're gonna find minis as well as BMW X3s being fabricated for cross-country rallies. Now they're not actually minis and X3s, they're actually very heavily modified tube frame chassis that look like minis and X3s. And they compete in cross-country rallies. So what is the difference between a normal rally and a cross-country rally? Well, the name states it very simply. These are trucks meant to go long distances on their own, self-dependent, um, with supplies, with gear, in probably the worst and most rugged terrain the world has ever seen. There are several cross-country rallies in the world, including Abu Dhabi, Morocco, uh, Portugal, uh, Poland. The biggest of, of those, of course, is Dakar. That's really the motorsports event that kicks off the year in January. It's a 14-day event where you see these trucks going anywhere between 500 to 800 kilometers in a day. Some of them finish the stages in 10 hours, some of them 25 hours. I met one person who has done Dakar, and he said, okay, you didn't do this, are you interested to go to Dakar? I said, yes, it's an adventure. It's the biggest adventure probably in motorsports you can do, and it's probably beside, let's say, Le Mans, the biggest challenge you can do in motorsports. I saw this race in Africa and I saw the, in a movie, in a TV, tele, television, and I saw a very nice landscape. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, I want to do this race because the landscape are really incredible and I want to do this race. And when I start, when I did my first race in Africa, it was amazing for me. It was, I said, okay, this is my race. I want to do this kind of race because it's the best competition. You know, it's, it's, the, it's one of the last things maybe in motorsport Okay, you have a technology, but exists the human side, you know. You need to fight by, by, by yourself to come to the end of the stage, you know. Yeah. It's yeah. not like in circuit racing, you have to know in cross-country racing, you race against an enemy where you don't know where he is. Yeah. The whole day, yeah. because you're alone, you're not seeing anybody. It's like a mental game. It's yeah. a men it's the yeah. whole Dakar is a mental game. You must be mentally very strong to survive. We start with a, with a chrono, with a time. Yeah. And sometime during all the day, five hours for the stage, for example, you, you see nobody, no the car, and you don't know exactly what is your time, what is your position on the, on the classification. This is, this is a very tricky mental game to know where you are, what speed you do, and you cannot do 100% all day because nobody can drive six hours 100% full stop. That's yeah. not possible. Yeah. Yeah? So it's a, that's the much bigger challenge compared to most of the other races where you don't know where, you are, where your other competitors are. So that's our small workshop. Small. Small, small and very For us it's too small actually already. Yeah. Uh, we are, at the moment it's okay, but on the Dakar preparation, this here is full, full, full. We park the cars in the middle even because it's not enough space. At the moment, we are considering building a new place basically next door. So that's are basically the, the, the work base. We have got still some with lifts, and but most of the, the base are without lifts. 
Um, a lift has got an advantage when you build a car the first time, it's nice, but for training for the people, you try to run them on a stand like this. Um, still, some cars because of space, and when you do some cars quickly, it's nicer to do it like this. Uh, that's, for example, Stefan's car from this Dakar. Um, the one I want. This is the car, the real car which won. It looks still quite nice, nearly <laughs> brand new, because this is what Stefan is is doing to his cars because all the cars he raced, I can tell you, are like new when he raced them. You know, uh, if you are too much aggressive with a car, it's really easy to break something. I prefer to drive very smooth and not too much aggressive. I did uh, 10 Dakar with a motorcycle and I never had a big crash. If you look underneath, there's no tubes bent, no nothing. The car, we did some very little marks on the front but the rest is 100% original, no scratches, <laughs> no nothing. That's him. Nice <laughs> work. I prefer to, you know, to, to feel, to feel the, the time to, to, to be full attack. Sometimes I have not a good feeling, so I prefer to reduce the speed. Or yeah. sometimes I'm really confident. And this time it's, it's, uh, it's really perfect to be full attack. So it's okay. so just a question of feeling. The actual planning for the Dakar from a technical point of view starts even a year, more than a year before. Basically when we are finished and send the cars out in late November, we are already planning for the following Dakar, which is basically one year and one month later. The car, the car itself has got basically, it's a, it's a mini body, a mini countryman body. Um, underneath you have a tubular frame. It's made to the specifications, what we are allowed to do from the, from the uh, regulation. Uh, the regulation on the Dakar is quite tight. You have a maximum wheelbase or wheelbase of two meter ninety, okay. which is not a lot. Um, and what limits us more is the suspension stroke, which is two hundred fifty millimeters. That's the that's the, that's tra the travel what you can have, and that's about that much to wow. give you an idea. Uh, and you run through holes like this, and you must be still fast. So we spend lots of time and money on suspension development. The uh, shock absorbers you've got here, I think, is at the moment probably the most sophisticated you can get around the world. Uh, us and WRC are basically keeping up like this. At the moment I think we're a bit higher because our uh, company supplying the shock absorbers is now we are the lead basically uh, company where they develop the shock absorbers is. This is really the business end of the whole operation. This is where the co-pilot sits, navigator, uh, mechanic. Um, well, in fact, they each can do each other's job, but this guy is actually the one that's actually most active. And behind the scenes, when you talk to these guys, they say the guy in the right seat is actually doing more than the guy in the left seat because he's got to focus on navigation. He's got to focus on telemetry coming off of the car, making sure all the systems are working properly, and as well as uh, making sure that the driver keeps his right foot down. Um, and the redundant systems. Now, you won't see the GPS systems here because that's actually issued by the FIA uh, two days before you, the event starts. So there's no unfair advantage in terms of those GPS units um, ahead of time. You do get the typical rally trip computers, redundancy as well. Um, simple controls on the right-hand side that the driver can use, as well as buttons on the floor so they can, they can hit, um, reset the trip computer with the feet if they've got the book in their hand got a sequential six-speed transmission uh, mounted to the front uh, diesel three-liter turbo, uh, turbocharged motor. It's a BMW motor like uh, out of the X3. The other thing to remember with the GPS is that it's, it's not actually what they use to navigate with. Um, it only, the reason it's issued by the FIA is because it is not actually the primary source of getting from point A to point B. That's what you use the trip computers for. That's part of the challenge of doing the car, or doing Abu Dhabi or Morocco. Um, the GPS units only actually are activated within, with, when you're within three kilometers of your checkpoint. So if you're outside of that three kilometer radius, um, you're not actually seeing anything on the GPS. That's, that's part of the challenge. You have to get within the three kilometers and then it turns on. Um, and that's one of the very cool and interesting parts of the sport is that it's not only about going fast, but being consistent and getting there in the correct manner, in the correct way. Um, and yes, it is an off-road vehicle, and when you're off-road, you can go as fast as you want. 
but just like any other rally, you are using public roads and that also means that you have to abide by public speed limits. So they've actually got a very interesting way of doing the pit lane speed limiter. Um, so you could choose what kilometer an hour you need to be driving and just set the car to do that and the driver just stays flat. Um, so it's actually the co-driver that's dictating how fast the driver is going. It's very interesting. Very cool stuff. Like any rally car, you need to bring supplies with you on your trip. Um, of course, there's the essentials like water, um, some food, uh, tire, wrench. But when you do uh, cross-country rallies like the car, like Abu Dhabi, like Morocco, you've got to bring a lot more, things that are unexpected. So uh, it's not only what you bring, but where you hide those supplies. Um, for example, uh, keeping the center of gravity low, right by the exhaust, you'll actually find a, an axle. Um, and deep inside here, you'll find uh, air jacks, you'll find other tools, other supplies. In here you've got um, uh, safety road kits, um, uh, torque wrench, um, air gun, and then as you come back here, you're not just bringing one tire with you, you're actually bringing upwards of three. So one here, one here, and another one that can fit here. You're not always bringing three, but you can bring three. All the tires are exactly the same, so you could put any of them on any uh, any side of the car. Um, over here, of course you've got your first aid kit, uh, your water, and then inside, um, every nook and cranny is uh, a place to hide something that you may need, because you never know, especially if you're 300, 400K out in the middle of the desert, um, and you're the only one that can work on the car, you have to bring everything with you, or that could just cost you um, a year of preparation and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So you're trying to assure that everything that could go wrong, um, there's a plan for it, Murphy's Law. Um, and that's kind of the, the beauty of this, especially in these remote countries. Uh, you, you can't just pick up supplies anywhere alongside the road, you gotta bring them with you, which is what makes these cars so remarkable. Yes, they're fast, yes, they're reliable, but they're also kind of the, the perfect bug out vehicle. You can literally uh, live out of this vehicle if you really needed to for days at a time. And of course, uh, the people behind the wheel are not only excellent drivers and, and co-drivers and, and navigators, but they're also mechanics. They need to know how to work on the cars. And because there is no communication directly to the service area, unless you have a satellite phone, um, you really have to uh, have the ability to think on your feet and think fast. When I stopped with a motorcycle, I started um, now 13 years ago with a car. Yeah. And it was the first time with Jean-Paul Cotret, my co-driver, yeah. and we are again together. So during uh, 13 years, we did all the racing together. Is probably, not probably, is the best uh, co-driver in the, the world of Rally Red. He never said to me, for example, hey, Stefan, you are too fast, slowly, slowly, it's really, really cool inside the car. And, uh, but I think that maybe he's the boss inside the car. <laughs> <laughs> I okay. don't like to do a mechanics, but my co-driver, his first job was mechanics, okay. so he liked to do it. So okay. it's a good balance uh, with, with him. <laughs> you give him the water while yeah, he changes yeah, the exactly. I give him the tools, <laughs> key number 12, key number 14, <laughs> but uh, he manages everything if we, if we have a problem. Cool. You have a very high fuel tank, a very big fuel tank. You talk about 400 liters on a diesel car and about 600 on a petrol car. Yeah, this you had open already. Uh, because if you see the, that's three spare tires which you need during the day and sometimes you need, really need them and you have the fuel tank there below. Um, which has a capacity here of not quite 400, but that's enough for us because fuel consumption is quite good on, on a car like this. Minimum range is 800 kilometers. Um, without this, you are not allowed basically to start. It's a prototype. The body is a little bit bigger than a real countryman um, because it is a four centimeter wider and 5% bigger in total to have all the possibilities to fit everything inside. Got it. Um, still, there are some some original parts on the on the car. Uh, besides this one, obviously lights and door <laughs> handles and, and, and the glass even at the front, the front window is an original glass really? from, a, from a countryman. So we try to use as much as possible things from an original car. Cool. The people you've got in the team, most of them are very special. It's a, it's a crowd of mechanics, engineers, technicians who really love this sport as well. 
if they haven't got the motivation, it's very, very difficult because um, without this, you will not survive. And I can tell you, I've got big people, tall people, really strong people starting to cry after day two because they couldn't take it. So you have to find the people who are very good skills, love the job, are very focused on details as well. Starting from the heart of the, of the car, which is the engine, yeah. um, which is from BMW or Mini, basically uh, we used until last year full prototypes. So we were always two to three years ahead of the normal production okay. engine. So a lot of things went back to the factory and have been then introduced in the standard. Yep. Yep. Is there an element of, uh, you know, if you were coming up and there was a car ahead of you that started before you that crashes, do you guys help? What's the, what's, yes. what's the etiquette in terms of, if there's a car broken down and they're okay, do you keep going? But when not, you stop, always. You always stop? Always. Always stop. I think, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this is part of the game, you know? Yeah. You start, and when you see some accident, uh, and the guy say, okay, okay, Good. you start. But normally, I, when I see some crash, always a stop. Yeah. Minimum to ask. Yeah. If it's okay or not okay. And when you see something, you stop and you take out. 15 minutes down the road from X-Raid's workshop is a quarry. And like any other quarry, this one is filled with construction equipment and very large boulders. Boulders you don't want to hit in a half a million dollar truck. Earlier in the day, Will Barber, the guy responsible for shooting all these driven episodes, came out to the quarry and rode shotguns against some B-roll. When I met up with him, he told me the footage he got was pretty much unusable because of the ride. But he also said one other thing, and this is a true story. He said, Quote, I will never have to go to space after what I just experienced. Thank you. So tell me, what, what, this is your first time on this or no? No, this, this truck, yes. Uh, it's, it's time done today, but normally sometimes it's come with, uh, with test something in the car here. Got it, okay. You know, before come to Morocco, test little bit the car, but uh, all last year also make some good drive. Does this simulate anything in the car? Yeah, the car is the same. Oh, okay. The car you know, this is the, the, the right side, it's a difficult place. Huh? <laughs> Thanks. As we set off, you don't this is a difficult place to be. It's really difficult. <laughs> No control, only you have some stupid guy in one side to flat out, but not more. But but in the end, the co-driver have only the, the co-driver have a little bit power. Yeah. You know, he's have a capacity to say okay, go slow down and this, but don't have a control about the car about nothing. You know. Got it. Whoa. There's a lot of throttle control. Yeah, yeah, you know, I break in the, in the mic, the left foot, you know, and this is have a control with the car. So you're, oh, you're, oh look, look that, oh, 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 oh. Yeah. I have gas and I throttle, throttle and, 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 and brake, you know. You're, you're rotating the car with the brakes and throttle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When I come like that, yeah, and I brake to the right foot, yeah, I brake and, and the car, oh, oh, I don't have a control, you yeah. know, look that. Yeah, car stepping out. Yeah. Okay. And the same thing with the with the left foot. Look. Whoop, 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 whoop. Yeah, yeah. Whoop, whoop. You know what you Yeah, got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. I have whoa. always always like that. I have a speed. With this, I have a capacity to walk. Whoa, but you know. Sure. 
Yeah. Probably using the compression of the car to help slow yeah. down. And the inertia from turn, you know? I yeah. bam, bam, yeah. and, and I turn, you yeah. know? It is, you need to use all the powers from help you, Got you know? It. Got it. I, I feel the grip, and it's okay, you know? Got it. When, when I don't have the grip, this is oh, that was a train. <laughs> Holy s**t! <laughs> Doing 100, 110k over a bump. You, hey, but, but you imagine uh, 100, 100 kilometers here. Yeah. This is hard. You know, now uh, it's 3, 4, 5 kilometers, but when you start the stage like uh, 400 kilometers, 800 kilometers, yeah. it's different. Oh boy. And now we go to Donuts. Awesome, man. <laughs> I've been in a lot of fast cars in my life, but that was pretty fun. That was actually the most fun I've had yeah? in, a, in a vehicle, yeah. yeah. yeah.